Welcome back to the cover, our coverage of the Los Angeles Times Book Festival. I'm Jeffrey Brown of the PBS News Hour, News Hour, and I am joined now by Dan Egan. He's the author of The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. And this is a nice one for me because it also happens to be the pick for our book club uh, that, that the News Hour and the New York Times started recently called Now Read This, which everybody should know about and join. Dan, nice to talk to you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so this this book, you were just telling me before we started. I mean, you're a you're a daily journalist, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm a, a beat reporter at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and I've been covering the Great Lakes as my beat for since 2003. Yeah. And you know, it's not a normal beat. It's not like I turn out a lot of daily stories for the daily paper. I write big long projects, and after about a decade. These projects started ch kind of stacking up like chapters. Yeah, and you realize you had something. I did, and some other people prodded me as well. Yeah. I was busy. I mean, I was busy being a full-time newspaper reporter, yeah. busy with my family. Yeah. I didn't think I had time for a book. And what was the something? I mean, when you looked at it, you, uh, the, what was the great subject you suddenly had? Well, you know, it took leaving Milwaukee. I left Milwaukee for a year and went out to Columbia University, and I think it took some taking some distance from the lakes and to realize that I was maybe getting a little bit too close to this story. Yeah. And, and the story is the ecological unraveling of the world's best, largest, greatest freshwater system. And when I was out in New York and I would tell stories about the history of how salmon are artificially stocked in the lakes or how they were destroyed by an eel-like uh, lamprey in the uh, middle of the 1900s, uh, people were fascinated, and you know, I stopped looking at it so much as work and started looking at it more as a story. You know, one of the things I like at the beginning here, I mean, you, you grew up around there and you sort of had a sense of it. For most of us, most of America, we know the Great Lakes, but we don't really know what that means. Yeah. We don't know the scale, we don't know the size. Yeah. So I like at the beginning, you spend some time just telling the history, telling the scale. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, to, to try to convey the scale is a real challenge. And, you know, the, the simplest way I found is to compare it to the United Kingdom, which is 94,000 square miles. And yeah. few people would think of that as just an island. And these lakes span 94,000 square miles. And they're not just lakes. They're seas. They're, they're freshwater seas. And they, can t they cradle mo more coastline than, than the Pacific and the Atlantic combined. It's 10,000 miles of coastline. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we think of lakes sound quaint, right? Yeah. But not in this context. Yeah, no, no. They're more than lakes. They're great lakes. So one of the stories you're telling is, a, is about a success story of things having gone bad, right? I mean, for a lot of people, you think of the pollution, early pollution, yeah. right? You think of the lakes on fire, right? Yeah. That's, that's the first story you have to tell. Huh? Yes, yes, kind of the industrial plundering yeah. of the lakes. And then came a second wave of pollution. And it's a kind of pollution that people don't naturally think of as pollution, but it's invasive species. And these invasive species, these invasive species have primarily, in the recent decades, been brought in by overseas ships sailing up the St. Lawrence Seaway, mm -hmm. which is an artificial, largely artificial shipping canal that links the Atlantic and the Great Lakes. And, and that unleashed all manner of ecological chaos that is still having effects that biologists can't understand today. Well, before we get back to that, because that goes back to the, the first story you're telling, which is the, the dream of opening up the Great Waterway, right? Yeah, yeah. Because that, somehow you have to connect the ocean to those Great Lakes. And I think people know about, like, the Erie Canal, but we don't quite know what all this means. Yeah, and, you know... It, it made a lot of sense at the time. And you look at a map, a two-dimensional map, and it looks like we have um, an American Mediterranean. It's this big blue blob of the five Great Lakes connected by this tendril of water, which is the St. Lawrence River. And it just mm -hmm. looks navigable in two dimensions, but it wasn't. I mean, on that map, or not shown on that map, is Niagara Falls, which is uh, insurmountable to yeah. a boat. And then the natural roaring St. Lawrence River, which was equally impassable. So it took hundreds of years of lock building, canal digging, um, and channeling to the point where we could get 750 foot boats from the East Coast to uh, Duluth. I mean, that's uh, 2,300 miles inland. It's, it's remarkable to think about. And like I said, it made a lot of sense at the time, but nobody was thinking a couple steps ahead as humans are not yeah, likely to yeah, do. Yeah. And, and so we, we built this shipping uh, system 
it was almost obsolete the day it opened in 1959 because containerized vessels started sailing in 1956 and that demanded ever bigger boats. So, so it's kind of like a narrow gauge railroad in a way, the, the aquatic analog of a narrow gauge railroad. It can still handle big ships, but not ships that reflect a modern fre freighter fleet. I mean, that's funny though, because it's the whole story is a, a, a kind of tale of big, huge dreams, but then realities, re wrong-headed moves, right? Yeah. Small-minded moves in some cases. Yeah, you know, I try not to be too judgmental. I'm not a historian, um, but I, I was very conscious of the fact that, you know, a lot of people made decisions for, you know, reasons they thought were, were legitimate. Mm -hmm. And in their context, in their time, they did make some, some mm -hmm. sense. Speaking of these boats, you know, we, so they were too small to bring in. We don't get flat screen televisions and Nikes and Toyotas. We get basically steel coming in and grain going out. But what we also get is invasive species Yeah. because these boats pick up any manner of organism from any place on the globe and drop it in the lake. One biologist once described to me these boats as uh, syringes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the lakes were, were basically being just dosed with... Yeah. I mean, this goes to the unintended consequences that yes. you're talking about. So give a, a concrete example. You give a number in the book, but what's uh, to, tell, to help people understand what happened? Okay, well, you know, uh, dozens of species have been introduced by these ships. None have been more devastating than the quagga and the zebra mussels, mm -hmm. which are about the size of your fingernail, thumbnail yeah. at, at biggest. And you look at one of these organisms and you think, how could this really do much damage to uh, such know, a huge space? Yeah. yeah. But you got to look at them not as uh, individual organisms, but almost like a, like a disease, like a cancer. Like one cancer cell is not going to really do a lot of trouble, but when you start counting them by the millions, or in the case of zebra mussels, quadrillions in the Great Lakes, then things start to change fast. And so what they've basically done is they've knocked the plankton population down to 10% of its historical uh, levels in, in some of the lakes at, at critical times of the year. And that's the bottom of the food chain. Mm -hmm. So you knock that out, everything up suffers, all the way up to the you know, lake trout that used to swim at th you know, three feet long. So... But it's more complicated than just changing, you know, the number of fish and the names of the organisms in the lake. Th this is really a biological pollution, and I'll give you a quick example of mm -hmm. how so. In Lake Erie, the mussels have so ravaged native uh, algae that, that they'll, they'll eat everything. They don't have brains, but they're smart enough to spit out the bad stuff. Yeah. And in this case, it's, a, it's an algae called microcystis, which produces a, a toxin called microcystin. And in August 2014, a plume of this microcystin got sucked into the Toledo drinking water intake, and it knocked out the drinking water for uh, almost 500,000 people for two or three days. And this wasn't a case where you could boil your way out of it. It wasn't a boil order. It was a do not drink any water yeah. order. And so this order came out at like 2 a.m. in the morning, and by 7 a.m., stores as far away as Ann Arbor, Michigan, were out of water, and they had to call in the National Guard. They were bringing in... Um, baby formula by the pallet. I mean, they, they were, and this is a city of almost a half a million yeah. people sitting on the edge of the world's largest freshwater system and they can't, they can't drink a drop. And so that's This is pollution. why it matters. Why, I mean, one yeah. of the reasons why it matters. Yeah, so. yeah, it, it yeah. does. I mean, it, it matters for that. It matters for these muscles clog pipes. And, and so it's like plaque in an artery in any industry. And there's lots of industries, lots of municipalities. Yeah. They need a steady supply of water and it gets choked off or it can without regular maintenance. I mean, another thing that comes through in this book is um, a lot of people looking at the lake, they see it as clearer than they remember. Yeah. You describe this yeah. and how a lot of people would look at it and say, oh, look how clean the lake is. But you have, you're pointing out that this is not the sign of a healthy lake. Yeah. It's, That's just, a, it's a little counterintuitive. It but, is, absolutely. Yeah. It's gorgeous. It yeah. really is. I mean, you fly in, you look from a bluff, and it's Caribbean blue. And, yeah. you know, it's which crystal it, which clear. Which was not in the past. It was not. A healthy, yeah. I live on Lake Michigan or nearby, and a healthy Lake Michigan is a brothy green. And, and today it's some of the clearest fresh water in the world. And clear isn't clean for some of the reasons that I was just explaining. Yeah. And it's also, it's, it's having the life sucked out of it, literally. Yeah. So. Who do you, um, I know you said you started doing this as, as part of your daily journalism, but there is a, a great history of this kind of literature. Are you familiar with it? Do you have models that you were thinking of? Well, there's some, some of the obvious... earlier, like Rachel Carson. Yeah, obviously. well, you know, people have, have uh, compared it to Silent Spring, and, you know, that's, 
I'm a newspaper reporter, so I've got to come at it as a newspaper reporter mm -hmm. and, you know, look at it as, you know, a two-sided, multi-sided mm -hmm. issue. You know, some of the work that influenced me, John McPhee, of course, and then um, like Wallace Stegner, there's some, some books I read right out of college. I, I grew up in, in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. I went to school um, in Michigan, and then I um, spent 10 years out in Idaho and uh, Utah. And uh, so, so Wallace Stegner and, and uh, Mark Reisner's Cadillac Desert. I would actually, every once in a while while I was writing this book, pick that up and look at it, and i just get a sick pit in my stomach because it's so darn good. Yeah. I mean, it's just... I mean, what did you, what did you see there that you... Because those are, those, are, those are writers, right? I mean, Yeah, uh, they're, they're writers, <laughs> and that's the thing. I mean, I, I, I guess now I'm a writer. Uh, <laughs> the day before this book came out, yeah. I was a reporter. Um, but no, I, you know, so it's... it's Thank you, but it's uh, it, I'm I'm not a typical author, and I'm I'm not coming at it with any great literary background or experience. I'm just a work a day, you know. I mean, I, I, that's a, I'm a little more than that because I do long projects at the paper. But I'm a beat reporter. Yeah, and that's where this came from. Well, you're doing pretty well because this is a great bestseller, and also you just won the prize here at the book festival last night. I right? did. Congratulations. Yeah, it was a thrill. Yeah. 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 History. Yeah, history. So you are a historian now. Today I am, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been telling a dark, a bad story, a, a negative story, yeah. but it's the death and life, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And you do end with some yeah. hope. Yeah, you know, I really focus on this notion of biological pollution, and there's really two primary pathways. One is the St. Lawrence Seaway, which I reference as the front door. The mm. other is the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal, which connected the Great Lakes to the Mississippi Basin. And those are two primary corridors for these invasions to take hold. And if we can shut these doors, and we don't have to shut them to the navigation that they contain, but we can shut them to the organisms. I mean, we have the technologies. We, we don't have, at this point, the political will. But if we can shut these doors, the lakes will reach a new balance. And I'll give a quick example. Mm -hmm. These mussels, which are really, you know, they're, they're not bad actors. They're just doing what they're built to do. They just they happen to be doing it in the wrong place, at right. least from our perspective. But the seaways brought us dozens of invasions. And not, at, not long after these mussels arrived came the round gobies, which are these little bug-eyed fish, not much bigger than my thumb. And they came from the same place, the, the Ponto Caspian Basin. They came from, or they came the same way up the St. Lawrence Seaway. And they are nature built to go to town on mussels. They eat them. They have like these little molars. They can crunch them, suck the protein out. So what they're doing is they're unlocking all the energy that's tied up in all these mussel shells. We're never going to have enough gobies to get control of the mussels, and I don't think we'd want that because then we'd have a goby pond. Mm -hmm. But, but they're healthy. there's healthy numbers of them, and any fish species that can figure out how to eat a goby is doing really well. And it just so happens it's the Great Lakes native fish that are figuring this out. So we've been... Really? Uh, so you could come full circle? We're coming full circle. Yeah. Like on Lake Huron, native lake trout have been sustained by hatchery stocking for, you know, more than a half a century. Now they're, they're looking at stopping the stocking program because the lake trout are resilient critters. They'll go down to the bottom and bang their snuts out and grub out a living on gobies. Whitefish, a native species, they're not piscivores. They're not normally fish-eating fish, but mm -hmm. if it's a death or a round goby, they'll take the goby, and they're doing really well. And mm -hmm. walleye, and so this is beginning to happen on Lake Michigan as well. The top of the food chain is starting to look more like its old self, in many ways, I mean, we're never going to get back everything that we've lost, but more like its old self any time than it has in the last 70 years. The bottom of the food chain may look a little bit more like the Caspian Sea, but there's, a, there's an equilibrium. There's a balance. Nature's trying to find a balance, which is what nature's yeah. good at. If we can just give it a breather, if we can slow these invasions or stop them altogether, um, I think that there's reasons to be optimistic. All right. The death and life of the Great Lakes, and you and I are going to talk again in Washington soon, yep. right? Yep. For the Now Read This Book Club. I will see you then. For now, thanks a lot. Thanks and for congratulations having me. on this. Thanks again.